assertion of the Einstein equivalence principle's local positional invariance. It's obviously not a test of local Lorentz invariance. We'll chat about more of these tests later. This entire thing is so important, it's worth repeating it. New tick is equal to some fraction times new emit. This fraction is essentially a gravitational blue shift divided by a gravitational redshift. But this ratio is so small that it's practically, in fact, for all intents and purposes, one. Therefore, the frequency observed at the top of the tower is the same as if it were the one emitted, so long as you're measuring inside of a freely falling accelerated reference frame. And this is what we mean when we say that the pound Rebke Snyder experiment strongly supports the Einstein equivalence principle. There is simply no measurable redshift in a freely falling frame. Within an accelerating, freely falling frame, exactly cancels out the immeasurable effects of gravity on all laws of physics. It's just like using special relativity in the absence of gravity. All objects in the freely falling frame, regardless of their composition or charge or nuclear properties, are all unaffected by gravity. All laws of nature will use the framework of special relativity in this freely falling frame. Special relativity is the kinematic framework that is known to be extremely accurate when you have no gravity. In sum, pound Rebka Snyder showed that you can't tell the difference between floating deep in space with no discernible gravity and falling in a uniform gravitational field. Let's now contrast that with our argument about Galileo's boat. That boat was not falling. It was either resting at anchor or sailing straight on a glassy sea. And it's quite obvious that Galilean relativity is much more limited in scope. Galileo and Newton both only considered frames of reference that were either fixed with respect to some absolute time or space, or were purely relative in speed. Both of them considered the effects of acceleration to be the core method of detecting whether or not your observation point was at rest, whether it was a butterfly smashing into the rear of the hold, or a cosmically isolated rotating bucket of water. Neither one of them considered the idea that the effects of acceleration could be canceled by measuring while falling along with that acceleration. This was Einstein's great insight while sitting in that chair in his Swiss patent office. This amazing breakthrough is now central to much of modern physics, especially the study of gravity. It's also pretty important to notice that the Einstein equivalence principle says that gravity is actually extraordinarily odd and different among all laws of the universe. The electromagnetic force, you only can cancel that force out by using uncharged neutrons. The weak nuclear force cancels the force by not involving, say, neutrinos or W plus bosons. The strong nuclear force, you can cancel it by assuring nothing interacts with quarks. And particles can be at rest while under the available influence of these forces, so long as they don't involve with neutrinos or they don't have charge or we're not talking about quarks. They can be at rest even while those forces are present. But you can't cancel gravity except by freefall. So there's something strange about gravity that says there's something about falling that's really new and different. And therefore, that's why we say that all laws of physics are the same in a freely falling frame and they're identical to special relativity when there's no gravitational fields. Gravity is just fundamentally odd and really different. There's no thing that says, let's turn off the charge on gravity. Let's say we have an anti-gravity um, particle. There is no anti-gravity particle, or there's no particle that says, huh, I don't do gravity. It doesn't exist. That's because all particles follow the shape of space-time. But before we get into that for just the briefest bit, Let's go quickly over some of the huge number of tests of the equivalence principle. In my video on the Way of Newton, Chapter 3, Section 1, I describe in painful detail the tests of the weak equivalence principle, or the test of universality of freefall. The great original was Edwish's torsion balance, which helped determine the value of g. The most accurate one today is the French ESA mission microscope, which found no violation of the weak equivalence principle to one part in 10 to the 15th. We also covered the Michelson-Morley experiment, which was hunting for the ether wind, but instead led to the observation of local Lorentz invariance, one of the two beating hearts of the Einstein equivalence principle. Dr. Who fans make some comment here. Modern clock timing anisotropy tests validate the local Lorentz invariance to one part in 10 to the 20th. That's an astonishing confirmation. 
We also went over the local positional invariance test of pound Rebka, but others exist, such as a lack of evidence for the change of fundamental constants of the universe in space and time. As for the strong equivalence principle, this is basically a test that G does not change in space or time. It's important to note that most alternative theories of gravity predict a change in the gravitational constant over time, so this is a hot topic of research. For example, orbital variations due to gravitational self-energy should cause a polarization of solar system orbits called the Noortveld effect. This effect can be and has been sensitively tested by the lunar laser ranging experiment. Up to the limit of one part in 10 to the 13th, there is no Noortveld effect. Another tight bound comes from modeling the orbits of binary stars and comparing the results to pulsar timing data. In 2014, astronomers discovered a triple stellar system containing a millisecond pulsar that has two white dwarfs orbiting it. This study also showed no variation in G either. And the best such data comes from studies of the ephemeris of Mars. Based on three successive NASA missions, the Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. These studies, along with Big Bang nucleosynthesis studies arising from WMAP and Planck, have shown that G cannot have varied by more than 10% since the creation of the universe. These tests are quite extensive, and all have not yet found fault with Einstein's original choices for how gravity should work. That is, gravity is the curvature of space-time, and all known forces obey this curvature, and further, that there are no additional forces in nature to counteract this idea. We have yet to see if the current Hubble tension will have anything to say that contradicts this, though, though there is growing consensus it might. In this last moment for this section, I'll touch on something I've alluded to a number of times in the past hour, that the bent trajectories of falling objects and even light are actually straight lines in curved spacetime. Einstein's theory of gravity is one that can be called a metric theory. This means you can create a method to determine total spacetime distance between two events in spacetime. At the top, I'm showing the Schwarzschild metric for a spherically symmetric spacetime centered on a spherical body, such as a star or planet or black hole with mass m. We define some special things like the Schwarzschild radius, r sub s. Mostly, though, this metric states what the total spacetime interval ds is, given changes in time, dt, changes in radial distance from the mass, dr, and changes in rotational orientation around the mass, d omega. We call each of these coefficients associated with the parts dt, dr, and d omega the components of the metric. These are commonly called little g with two Greek letter subscripts. Little g basically describes the shape of spacetime on a point-by-point -point basis that surrounds the mass m. We can construct interesting mathematical tools out of the metric, such as gamma, which has the formal title of a Christoffel symbol. It's composed of partial derivatives with respect to each of the coordinates of spacetime. This symbol actually represents a large system of equations and encodes the gradient of the spacetime. Just like a topological map of a mountainous hiking area shows a series of points of altitude, the slope or gradient of the mountain at a given point is determined by how close together the lines of the same height are placed on the map. The Christoffel symbols encode the points of the metric into the gradient of spacetime. So what happens when you let something roll down the mountain? For ease, pretend that the slope is free of small rocks and anvils, coyotes and roadrunners, and the ball will go faster and slower down the slope as it encounters the lay of the land. It will also trace a distinct path on the ground, given initial placement and some speed in some direction. At the bottom, we see the geodesic equation of motion for force-free motion through a metric space. The first term is the curvature of the trajectory, which is analogous to acceleration. The generalized gradient term is analogous to a force. Therefore, this geodesic equation is the F equals ma of general relativity. That zero at the end means that all free trajectories follow the principle of least action. This means that the path of freely moving particles, or light, will always be one that minimizes the travel time. In practical terms, this describes a straight path of light rays and the straight path of a box sliding across a smooth icy lake. A geodesic is the concept of a straight line in curved spacetime. To help understand this, let's go way back to Euclid's axiom that 
two straight lines that are initially parallel remain parallel whenever extended. Extended is a funny word here. What does that mean? It does not mean continued in such a way that the distance between them remains constant. Euclid means that, simply, the lines keep going in the direction it was a step before. With this idea, a geodesic is a path described by the geodesic equation that if you now place an arrow at any point on the path and move it along a little bit along that path, it'll stay pointing in the same direction. The crazy thing about this idea is that if you have a flat space, like everyone's idea of 10th grade geometry, and you take an arrow and keep it pointing in the same direction and take it for a walk around a closed loop like a square or a pentagon, then when you get back to the starting point, the arrow will have the exact same orientation as when it started. However, in a curved space-time, like the Schwarzschild metric, the Christoffel symbols and the geodesic equation combine together to make that arrow change its orientation when it gets back to its starting point. This all means that the downward curvature of the laser in the box is following exactly this space-time metric. This is pure geometry, but not a geo-thing like the Earth, but space and time itself form a manifold that is connected together differently than a flat sheet of paper or cubes or boxes, like you worked with in your old Euclidean geometry from high school. Sadly for us, cosmology has no use for this Schwarzschild metric. We only care about the space-time metric for an isotropic, homogeneous space-time that is either expanding or contracting or standing still. We'll not need the great and wonderful complexity of strong field general relativity until we take a look at the earliest moments of the universe. Next time, we'll be looking at how Einstein describes curvature in greater detail with a strong focus on this homogeneous isotropic space-time. Until then, I'll leave you with a succinct summary of Einstein's theory of general relativity by John Archibald Wheeler. Space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve.